We thank you, Lord, for all that you've given us and for how we are blessed to be your children. And we pray now for this offering. And Lord, we give it unto you with all the glory and praise that's within us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, it's good to see all of you here this morning. Put my glasses down a little bit so I can see you. Ooh. Yeah. And it's good to be here with you. Um, I am sorry for the circumstances, you know, with Pastor being as sick as he is. Please remember to pray for him um, this week as you go. Um, I don't know what all's going on, but he doesn't sound very good at all. So, now this sermon, since it came in one hour today, um, You've probably heard before, because I didn't write a new one. I just dug through them and, and looked for one, because I didn't have time to write a new one. <laughs> so, um, the title of this is, Is God Good? And most of you know the answer to that, I think. But, we're going to go through that today anyhow. So, how do we know that God is good? How do we know? Psalm 25, 8 says, Good and upright is the Lord. Psalm 34, 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Psalm 100, verse 5 says, For the Lord is good. And Mark 18, 10, 18 says, And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. So the scriptures tell us that God is good. We don't need people to tell us that. In fact, people sometimes will say the opposite. They will say things that aren't very nice. But we know that God is good, regardless of what happens in our lives. That was a hard part for me for a while. When I was young, um, things would happen, and I thought, God, I thought you're supposed to be on my side. What's going on here? But God was on my side. Is that enough? Things happen all the time that do not seem good. Have any of you had anything happen in the last year that didn't seem good? <laughs> yeah, I'd be willing to bet most of you did. And I did too. Um, in this last year and a half, I had a stroke and spent well over a year just getting... I didn't affect any of my legs or arms or anything but it affected my mind. Now, some of you may not believe that. You all think I was crazy anyhow, but uh, I could see a difference. And it took a while for God to heal that. And it's still kind of happening. I, there's still some things that I'm kind of going, wow, or addresses or things like that that I don't know. But I'm getting there. Do we consider God good? When someone dies, especially if it's a younger person, or maybe just someone that was really close to us, do we consider God good? Do we consider God good when a child is born handicapped? I've heard some of the... <laughs> excuses from people for that happening and it's all about you know how the devil got in and did this and did that and I was like oh God is the one who is responsible for our lives whatever they are and he has a purpose do we consider God good when the world is full of evil I mean you watch the news you read the paper walk down the street. The world is full of evil. But do we blame God for that? What is it that makes God good? I want to tell you my story, and most of you have probably heard it before, but you get to hear it again. Woohoo! Um, and it was about when my husband David died. And that's been... Uh, 
in two weeks it'll be seven years. Isn't that, that's unbelievable to me. But it's, it's good because I'm doing better than I have for a long, long time. Um, it took a long time to come to grips with that. Why that happened, why it happened the way it did. Um, was God really good? What was in this? Anyhow, David left for work that morning. It was a Monday morning. He kissed me goodbye, and he said, I'll see you around 7 o'clock. And I thought, okay, good. And I had things that I had to get done that day. But when he hadn't come home or called by 7 o'clock, I thought, oh, he probably found someone to talk to. He was always doing that. Um, he, he sold... Um, what was he selling at that time? Pictures. Yeah. Um, farm pictures. And he was always finding somebody to talk to. Whether they sold, he got, whether they bought a picture or not, he was finding somebody to yap at all the time. So, but that was one of the parts of his job that he loved. He loved talking to farmers and being on farms. And um, I don't know how many of you knew, but he was a farmer in his younger days. Um, but then his dad sold the farm, moved back to Pennsylvania, and he didn't want to. So um, he became lots of other things. Around 10 o'clock that night, my daughter called and said the sheriff's office had contacted her and told her that David had been in an accident and was in the hospital. Now, why they called me or her instead of me, I will never know to this day, but it was probably better. We lived in Stewartville at the time, so I drove to St. Mary's as fast as I possibly could. And when I arrived, he was still in the emergency room. An officer handed me his wedding ring when I came in, and he said, sit down. Can you imagine how that made me feel, what I was thinking? It was very, very difficult. We were shown to a waiting room, and they said they would keep us informed. And the family started gathering. <clears throat> there are 12 of us that are intimately part of our family, and then there's lots of others, but 12 of us for sure. Six hours later, <clears throat> we were told that he was still in the emergency room because they couldn't stabilize him, and that meant to keep him breathing. Later, we found out that he wasn't breathing when the emergency workers arrived at the scene um, where the accident was. And um, the accident he was in, he had pulled out of a side road, and there was a tr uh, truck. <laughs> what? Yeah. Full of grain. That's it. And he pulled out and f somehow or the other he didn't go fast enough or something and the truck hit him. Um, so he was, he was there and we were waiting for them to stabilize him. And it took an hour before they decided we're just going to have to do the best we can and go. So they stuck him on the Mail one and took off. Two hours later, they finally moved him from the emergency room to intensive care. He had 64 stitches in his head. His eyes were swollen shut, and he had multiple other scars and stitches all over his body. Um, and for you to understand this, it hit him on the, the passenger side but it tore that seat clear out and shoved it over on top of him on the driver's side. And the whole front end of the car was just like that. I don't even know how they got him out, to tell you the truth. So for two weeks, he lay in a coma with whirling machines keeping him alive. That was an interesting period of time. Um, 
I'm glad the kids were there, but it was kind of neat because it ended up with me having to be the strong one and having to minister to them and everybody that came in. <coughs> Whoa. How's that? Ha. Okay. Um, so at this point, we consulted the palliative experts at the hospital. And they're the ones that help families make decisions about long-term care or terminating um, the care that somebody's already receiving. They said it was unlikely that he would recover. The damage to his head and brain were extensive. And if he regained consciousness, he would most likely be a vegetable. That, I knew, was not something he wanted. For those of you that knew David, you know he was always, <sighs> you know, just gung-ho and going and moving. And, and there is no way that he would, ha even though he didn't know it, he wouldn't appreciate laying in a bed being a nothing. Um, they said we'd have to put him in a nursing home north of the cities because they were the only ones that could take patients like him. And he probably would only live five to six years before some other disease killed him in his weakened state. He would never be strong again, never be able to deal with anything that hit him, and they said he would never wake up. Or we could choose to let him go. The kids and I prayed and cried and decided what it was that we should do. We ended up asking the hospital to remove all the machines and everything except oxygen and morphine. So oxygen so he could breathe and morphine so he could stand to breathe. <clears throat> that was Tuesday night at 7 p.m. and they did that. Our children, our children's children, and I gathered around his bed and started singing hymns. Within the hour, David had passed into glory. He was 56 years old. So he was so young, you couldn't even believe that that would be happening, but that was what God required at that point in time. What was God doing or thinking for letting him go when he was so young and so full of life and just energy? He could run circles around me, <laughs> and he did. What did he mean for letting him be in such a horrible accident? It was unbelievable how badly he was mutilated. I mean, the car was nothing compared to him. But Jesus himself said in John 12, 24, Truly, truly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now, of course, he was talking about himself being crucified. But it applies to us as well. All of our afflictions and trials were designed to put us in the arms of God to demonstrate his faithfulness. Isn't that cool? That something as horrible as this was actually a demonstration of God's faithfulness. During the two weeks that David was in ICU, our family camped in one of the waiting rooms. <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever been up to the ICU floor, but they have huge waiting rooms. They're probably... You know, maybe a fourth the size of this, maybe a little bit bigger. There was room enough for all 12 of us anyhow. Um, and while we were camping there, there was somebody there 24 hours. <clears throat> and most of the time there were five or six of us there, if not all 12 of us. It was a really rough time. My middle daughter's birthday um, was the day after the accident. David's birthday was two days after the accident. 
and Thanksgiving was three days after the accident. It was <clears throat> kind of rough, you know. We had decided we were just going to forget about Thanksgiving that that year and and just take care of him and do what needed to be done. But then some people from Amanda's church came in and they brought a whole huge Thanksgiving meal. And they put some tables in there and set it up for us. And they made us eat. And I'm glad they did. It was one of the things that helped kind of level things out a little bit, which is almost more than you can do it at a time like that. Upwards of 100 people came in to see us during that time, and not Thanksgiving Day necessarily, but during the two weeks that David was in the hospital. And many of them testified later how their lives were touched by the way God ministered through us. And that was the neatest thing, because God didn't allow us to sit and... <gasps> he, he chose us to minister to people that came in that were going... <gasps> it was so cool. And what a blessing that time was. God took our sadness and our pain and used it to help others. Isaiah 55, 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. And boy, that was true. You know, I would have done things way differently than God did. But praise God, he was in control. He had the authority. Often as human beings, we tend to judge God. We call him unfair, unkind, unloving, mean, nasty, you know, what were you thinking, God? We could have holed up in the waiting room, crying and spewing out lies about our Heavenly Father, or we could have accepted his love and comfort as we did. The incredible comfort that we receive from him still amazes me. And three of my four kids are Christians. And it was so obvious because they just, everybody that came in, they just reached out and hugged them and prayed for them and talked to them. And my son and his wife were there, and they aren't believers yet. Uh, but they're going to be. Yep. And um, it was just, it was a special time. And I was... I was really pleased and proud of my kids and the ones that that reached out. And, of course, there were times where they were sitting and crying and they couldn't help at that moment. But it didn't last long. And then they were up and doing things. We ministered to many people in the ICU and their families. That was one of the really neat things is because we were at the end of the hall. So there was our room and then... Other ICU and um, rooms for emergencies were all the way past us. So we got to see everybody who came in, who was coming in to be with an emergency person. And it was really neat because we could hear them in their room. And, and it was so special because we would go down to their rooms and say, Hey, what happened? Can we pray for you? Can we help you in any way? And there were, I don't remember how many people, probably 12 at least during the two weeks we were there. And every one of them said to us, yes, please. So we got to minister to them while we were there, you know, because my husband was there. But it was really special. And um, a couple of them, after they, their loved one had been taken care of and was going to get better and everything was good. They came back to our room and told us, thank you for praying for them, that they really believed it was what turned them around and, you know, a lot of things like that. It was so special. <clears throat> it was a really incredible comfort that we received from God at that time. And it was... 
it enabled us to reach out and meet the needs of other people. We didn't have to spend all that time, the 12 of us in one room, sobbing and, <laughs> you know, going crazy. We were there, I feel, because God wanted us to minister to these people that came in. And he gave us the ability to do that. It got to the point where these people would stop by our waiting room headquarters <laughs> and ask if we were the ones that prayed for people. And they would allow us to pray for them or some other people that they had either in the hospital or, or something. We spent so much time praying when we were in there. I, I can't even believe it. John 4, 16b says, God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. A God who is love must be, by default, a God who is good. Have you ever considered that? A God who is love must be a God who is good. I mean, that makes sense, doesn't it? How could he love us? How could he love anybody unless he was good? And that's one of the things that we had to keep in mind a lot during those days. It was easy, you know, because we'd go in and see David. And um, and he was just just laying there, and he looked dead. And he had this great big thing of stitches going across his head, and stitches here and stitches there, and bruises almost everywhere. And he looked horrible. Um, but... That was our job. Our job was to be there for him and for other people that came in. And we were touched by the outpouring uh, to our family. Different churches, and there were about probably 10 churches that we had friends in or had attended or something. We were known to them brought in different meals for us at different times. Every, every day, one church would bring in three meals. And that was for, you know, 14 days. That was so special to me. When you think of it, you know, two weeks times three meals a day times 12 family members times 14 days. Wow. God's family reflecting his goodness you know and sometimes I think we don't think of that when we're in the hospital and we have a sick person or a dying person in the hospital we don't think of how good people are to us and what happens and I could fill a book with all the things we saw and felt God at work during that time but I want to encourage you instead. Don't waste your sorrows. God gives us sorrows. You know, we don't like to believe that. We think God only does good things. And he does. Because sorrow works good things in our lives. I recently read a newsletter. This is probably two years ago now. Uh, by Gary Wilkerson, and he brought out three points regarding suffering and affliction. And he said, we waste afflictions with murmuring and complaining behavior. Wow. Have you ever thought of that? We waste afflictions when we face new ones without remembering our deliverance from the old ones. Because every time we come up against something, it's like, Ugh, blah, 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 blah. and we forget the back here and back here and back here and back here. God found a way to set us free and to help us and to, to heal those hurts. And he's going to do that until we're with him. That's the coolest thing. We waste our afflictions when we refuse to see that God brings us through them in order to teach and encourage others. Huh. It's not all just about us. Have you ever thought that everything God does is just for you? No. He uses us to help other people, even when we're in the midst of hard, bad things. 
The world is full of pain and sorrow. People need hope. People need God. Because God is where hope is. Our lives are God's, and our purpose is to bring him glory. Regardless of what's going on in our life, regardless of what's happening, our purpose is to bring God glory. So if things are bad and hurtful, give him glory. And if things are good and wonderful, give him glory. He is worthy every day, every circumstance. He is worthy. Give him glory. God is good. And that's the thing we have to remember. God is never bad, regardless of what we think and what we act and sometimes what we say. God is never bad. I've been a Christ follower for a long time. I'm not going to even tell you, because it's longer than most of you are old, probably. Um, and I've kept a journal of all those things. And I have seen myself change in ways many times as I'm writing in this journal and I think, oh, yeah, oh, and I write that down. And it's a lot different than what I wrote a year before or two years before. Um, the other day I was digging through some stuff in the storage room and I found a whole box of old journals. <coughs> so I took some time to sit and look through some of them. And I thought to myself, who is this weird person that was writing these journals? She is so strange <clears throat> because I've changed so much in 40 some odd years, okay? Have I ever seen the hand of God change? Never, never, never. That is the coolest thing. God doesn't change. He is faithful and true, and he never changes. He is always good. When I think back over my life, I can see God's help and deliverance even before I learned to trust him. That's the coolest thing. You know, I think back to when I was a a teenager. I got saved when I was 24. So it's been a day or two. But when I think of the times before that, <clears throat> how I didn't plan on God, but God planned on me. And he let me know that even though I wasn't thinking of him or appreciating him or anything else, he let me know he was there. And that made it so easy, I guess, when I finally came to him, if, if coming to God is ever easy. <laughs> but I knew that I would come to him and that he was watching over me. Because if he hadn't, I know I would have been dead without Christ. But God defended me and protected me and looked over me and waited and brushed and pushed and whatever else God does to get us to come to Jesus. But I knew that he was there. Praise his holy name. He is faithful and true. He is good. Let's hear that. Come on. He is good. One more time. He is good. Yes. Amen. Psalm 135.3 says, Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises to his name for it is lovely. Ha! That's so cool. You know, I think about that, and this last week or two, I've been thinking about a lot of things, about times past. And it always kind of happens about this time that David was, you know, in the hospital, and, and then he died. There's always things I think about. But this year, it's been exciting because... I see how far I've come in those seven years. 
that I am much farther along than I used to be. And I am so grateful for that. Now, do I think I'm where I will be? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> I hope I still keep growing in the Lord until the day I die. There's room to. There's room for us to grow and to become more like him every day. So there's a few little notes here that I want to share that are a little bit different than that, but yet they're not. Um, John 1, 9 through 11 says, The light shines in the darkness. The world did not know him. The fact that the light overcomes the darkest darkness is the issue. The wicked want to put out the light, but they can't. And they want to ignore his love, but they can't. You know, they may think they are, but they're not. It's still back here pushing them and twiddling and so we give the adversary too much credit with our fear. There is no reason to fear him whatsoever. No reason. And that's been one of the coolest things this last year as I've been getting back on my feet again and, and, and I think getting a new mind because <laughs> the old one was pretty... Um, it's just been neat to see I don't have to fear anything, especially not the devil. And that's the exciting part of this. I don't have to be afraid. God's, uh, the name of the adversary is not Satan because he is the Satan or adversary. God didn't even give him the honor of a name. We have, but God didn't. He was the adversary. He was the, the Satan. He was the bad dude, but he never gave him a name. He is a created being. Why do we give him power equal to God? God is not created. God has always been. That makes him greater than anything or anyone that could be created. And Satan was a created being. When Jesus was crucified and rose again, he completed the prophecy or the promise in Genesis 3.15. He will bruise your heel, that's the dirty devil, and you will crush his head. Yes. I mean, a bruised heel you can deal with. You have a hard time making it without a head. Yeah. We have been given praise and thanksgiving and worship, which is the honor and majesty and glory. You are you have no rival and no equal. Praise his name. No equal, no rival, no one who can even touch him. So why do we act like they can? They can't. And who stands at his side? We do. And we have to believe and understand that he defends us and protects us. Now, does that mean you're never going to have a hard time? No. Because did Jesus ever have a hard time? Uh-huh. You betcha. But that means that ultimately we are his and he is ours. And there's a, a Hebrew cry that they used to give all the time, and it's rock, kazak, amatz. Isn't that cool? <laughs> you don't even have any idea what that means, do you? But that's a war cry. <clears throat> and, and part of what it's about is, are you fighting or resisting or willingly be tempted and used? 
Have you ever thought about that? Sometimes we think we don't have a choice, but we do. We may be, sure, tempted. We may be tried. But we always have the Lord as our victor with us. That is very cool. Isaiah 26.10 says, Though grace is shown to the wicked, he does not learn righteousness. Even in a land of uprightness, he will act wrongly and not... Hold on a minute. Not receiving the majesty of Adonai. That's an interesting thing. He'll be right in the presence of it, and yet he won't receive it. And that's one of the things I want to say to each and every one of you. Don't be like him. Set your mind. God is good. God is for me. God is with me. And no matter what happens, it's his baby. And that's one of the coolest things that I've come to in the last year or so. It's God's. What am I worried about it for? What am I trying to carry it for? Why am I fighting? It's God's baby. And he'll take care of it. There's um, a scripture in Psalm 91, uh, 14 through 16. And it says, because he loves me, I will rescue him. And that's talking about us. Because he knows my name, I will protect him. He will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him when he's in trouble. I will extricate him and bring him honor. I will satisfy him with long life and show him my salvation. Wow. How cool is that? There's a, uh, a few names I want to share with you. These are names of Adonai. And there's, <laughs> I have a book that's full of them. So he has a lot more than this. But this is some of them. Adonai, the Lord our God. Adonai Eloheinu, one Lord our God. Adonai Elohim, the Lord God. Adonai Nisi, the Lord my banner, or the Lord my miracle. It can be either one. Adonai Shalom, the Lord of peace. Adonai Shama, the Lord is there. Adonai Sidkinu, the Lord our righteousness. Adonai Tzavot, the Lord of hosts, or heaven's armies. Yeah. Adonai Yire, the Lord will see to it. El Elyon, Lord Most High. El Gibor, Mighty God. El Roy, Lord, you see me. El Shaddai, God is Almighty. Mashiach, the Anointed One. Yah, Yahweh. And Yeshua is God saves. Aren't those cool names? And that's just a few of them. And every one of them are ours to hang on to. And to believe in. Are any of these names bad? No. God is good and in so many mighty ways. That is the coolest part of it. And that's been one of the things. I mean, I've been a Christian for a long time, 40-some years, almost 50. And... Um, but yet it's only been this last year. And I've, I've, I've studied all these before and all that. But God has changed my mind. He has made my mind a deeper thing than it was before. Um, there are three levels of knowledge and intimacy. Yahweh, the creator, ruler, God inspires awe. Yeshua, Redeemer, Lover, God, inspires worship. And the Holy Spirit, Comforter, Convictor, God, inspires relationship. 
Isn't that cool? All the ways that God has revealed himself are all ways that we as human beings can take and make part of us. That's so cool. I'd like to close with a little bit of a prayer. Thank you, Father, for this mighty gift, for coming in the flesh that we might know you personally, that we might worship you and know whom it is we worship. The human heart longs to worship and will worship someone or something. Thank you for revealing yourself to us through Christ Jesus our Lord. Almighty God, we do worship you and we thank you for all you are, for all you've given us, for the way you protect and defend us. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.